Stephen Gavazzi is a professor in the Human Development and Family Science pro program at The Ohio State University. His research focuses on the family influence of raising healthy teenagers and the evaluation of family-based programs. He also teaches courses associated with individual and family development in addition to, cor to courses in family therapy. Dr. Gavazzi spent his entire adult life studying and working at land-grant institutions and is a fierce champion for the need of land-grant universities to rebalance the tripartite mission of teaching, research, and engagement. In the recent book, Land-Grant Universities for the Future, Higher Education for the Public Good, Dr. Gavazzi and co-author Dr. Gordon Gee explore the strengths and weaknesses of land-grant universities while, exam while examining the changing threats they face. Being responsive to the communities we serve is paramount for land-grant institutions to be successful in the future, which necessitates becoming more fiercely land-grant in our approach. And by the way, I'm proud to wear the pin. There is a critical importance of elevating both teaching and engagement excellence. For far too long, both components have been relegated to secondary roles in comparison to research prowess. Please help me welcome Dr. Stephen Gavazzi. Voila. Okay, well thank you Robert for that great introduction and Travis, uh, thank you uh, as uh, Robert had also done in, in uh, inviting me here and to also to the Empowering Teaching Excellence Committee for having agreed to have me out here. Uh, the official title of my talk is Teaching Excellence, the Essential Core of the Land Grant Mission. I'm also, I'm a big Twitter fan, and so the hashtag that I thought we should use for this would be ETE 2019. So we're also, though, apparently, uh, there's a conference going on in France that is using ETE 2019, which is totally cool, because that means we'll just trend internationally if we keep using this. Uh, most of, but not all of, the uh, talk that I'm going to give today is uh, going to be based on the book that uh, President Gee and I wrote, and I believe there will be copies of that available uh, sometime this afternoon, and I'll be available to sign. Um, so thanks for doing that. This is my colleague, for those of you who don't know, West Virginia University President Gordon Gee. Look at that picture. Isn't, doesn't he look like a fun guy to write with? Yeah, well, he, this was a fun book to write, and I felt very privileged to have had the opportunity to um, write a book on land grants with someone who has been a university president for over 40 years now, twice at West Virginia University, twice at The Ohio State University, and uh, Brown and Vanderbilt and Colorado at Boulder. So, uh, Me, I'm land grant fierce, as Robert said in his introduction, and uh, after today, my hope is that you will all feel the same way. I hope that this dialogue goes on long after uh, I'm done with my 45 minutes here. And so the other hashtag that I would like us to use as we're tweeting about all of this is Land Grant Fierce. And speaking of Land Grant Fierce, I had posed a question on Twitter uh, to the entire Utah State audience, which was, tell me what it means to be Land Grant Fierce when it comes to teaching, and specifically teaching excellence. And this is the wordle that occurred. Uh, it, there are different things that jump out, but I think because of the relatively smaller numbers of responses that I got, I'd like to give you a sample of some of the actual quotes that I had collected, because many of them <clears throat> serve as the basis for the conversation that I would like to have with all of you this morning. So I've uh, highlighted in yellow some of the things that I think are particularly in interesting and important. I think the concept of service is extraordinarily important. Accessibility, equity, and especially, I love this last quote, meeting students where they are, both geographically and academically. I think this sets the stage for uh, at least a few of the remarks that I would like to make to all of you today about the land-grant mission and what it has to do with teaching. 
So the main issue at hand for today, and Robert mentioned this in terms of the take, his take on the book that I had, which is the question as to whether or not land-grant universities are maintaining a balanced, a balanced approach to their three-part mission. The answer to that is no, they're not. And uh, so my alternate title for today's talk is Recognizing and Overcoming Our Unforced Errors. So I'm going to be using a tennis metaphor today. Um, and so I'm hopeful that the way that we can approach this is by seeing that most of the things that we're doing wrong right now are the things that we ourselves are doing. That's the idea of an unforced error, right? In tennis, you hit the net instead of allowing the ball to go over. So the idea that most of what we're not doing very well right now as a land grant is the idea that it's an unforced error actually presents us with tremendous opportunities to correct some of the things that we are doing, especially in terms of the things that we're doing in the eyes of the public. So hopefully, uh, if anyone out there is feeling a little bit more land grant frazzled than land grant fierce, I'm going to present some ideas for how to change that. Okay, so in order to do this, I'd like to give you a little bit of the background in terms of the study that was embedded inside of this book on land-grant universities for the future. Um, <clears throat> my president, uh, President Michael Drake, uh, and uh, uh, President Gee co-wrote a letter to all of their land-grant uh, peers uh, all the presidents and chancellors across the country and had invited them to take part in this study. Shockingly, to me anyway, 27 of these presidents in the first week that the invitation was sent out uh, uh, responded positively to the, the invitation. Now this was especially shocking to me because I wrote my IRB up saying I would expect no more than 10 presidents and chancellors to actually participate in this. And so uh, I had to rewrite that section of the IRB and say, well, actually, I'm going to uh, include uh, more than double that. The great news was that this was actually um, uh, a sample that, first of all, was over half of all of the presidents and chancellors, but second of all, that it was geographically representative of the entire nation. So we had equal numbers of presidents uh, responding from the Northwest and the Southeast and the Southwest and the Northeast and the Midwest, so relatively equal numbers. This, by the way, was uh, done in 2016, 2017. Dan Albrecht was your president at that point in time. You were making the transition, so he had politely declined. So this does not represent Utah necessarily, at least in terms of having talked with your president. So the sample of 27 presidents were given basically four questions to, to address in their interviews with me. And this was basically a SWOT analysis. They were asked, what are the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities and the threats that their land-grant institutions in, in specifically, as well as their knowledge of land-grant universities in general, what they were facing in terms of trying to meet the needs of the communities that they were designed to serve. In large part, the answers that we got to those four questions gave us a glimpse into what ended up being these seven distinct themes that we pulled out of the qualitative data that we had gathered that showed evidence of conflicting priorities, or if you will, a dynamic tension that existed between opposite poles of thought on these seven different themes. And here they are. Um, I could spend an hour on each of the themes, uh, I highlighted two in yellow because I think that they have something to do with my talk today. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about them. But I'll give you a quick rundown. First, and every president talked about this, reduced funding, right? Most recently, Alaska has been in the headlines. Um, I saw this morning, however, that perhaps the draconian cuts of $300 million in a single year have been cut back to only 70 million over three years. But it, it serves as the latest example of funding cuts. Presidents and chancellors at land grants are, of course, thinking about this all of the time. And yet, 
They also at the same time understand that there are enormous pressures on academia in general, and land grants more specifically, to become more efficient with the public dollars that they are given. So um, that's theme, not necessarily uh, in, in sequential order of importance, but that certainly was the one that most presidents talked about. Second, the idea of being great at research. We have a, had a history of seeing how land grants in particular Land grants in particular have been uh, moving towards greater and greater resources allocated towards, resource, or towards research endeavors. As opposed to, and unfortunately it's oftentimes put that way, putting resources into teaching excellence or putting resources into engagement excellence. And so presidents noted this imbalance. Third, and related again to research, this idea of basic versus applied research, and uh, where universities should be, in fact, allocating more of their resources. Fourth, the idea of national rankings, which uh, the very bane of uh, existence, I think, for higher education is US News and World Report. I hate that report. It's largely an anecdotally based um, uh, ranking system, and uh, yet we see, especially governing boards uh, of major universities pushing for university after university to rise in the ranks of the US News and World Report. Now, how do I know that um, it basically US News and World Report rankings are BS? Well, let me give you one great example from my colleague, uh, President Gee. When President Gee became president of Brown University, about two months after he took office, he got a congratulatory letter from US News and World Report saying that the brand new rankings that they had just created for law schools put Brown University at number eight in the country. President Gee had to write back to US News and World Report and tell them that Brown did not have a law school. <laughs> so this idea of reputationally based rankings um, and you see this all the time, right? You see universities pushing out information about who they are and what they're... Th this is not a good practice. And, and, and the worst part about this, and I'll get to talking about this, is how it then adversely impacts accessibility and affordability. How does it do that? Do you know what the main levers are for US News and World Report besides reputation? One of the biggest is what your incoming class of freshmen's ACT or SAT scores are. And what kind of bias do you think exists from a socioeconomic status in terms of ACT and SAT scores? It's huge, right? There's a huge bias. And so we have problems with that, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But presidents are aware of that. Next is this rural versus urban distinction. When the land-grant universities were first founded, 1862, 90% of our population lived in a rural area, 90%. 10% lived in urban areas. Fast forward to 2019, and that's flipped almost exactly, right? So it's now almost 90% of our US population lives in an urban-based area, 10% in a rural area. Creates a lot of dynamic tension there. Next, presidents recognize this idea of an international focus, and we've heard more and more information over the years about how we want to become more global in our orientation. Presidents have seen that um, as a dynamic tension that exists in opposition to this idea of having what I call closer to home impact. This idea of not being international, or if you are going to be international, that you are continually recognizing how that impacts the citizens of your state. And then last, um, this was more of a general catch-all category, but presidents paying attention to things like the Pew Charitable Trust surveys have seen a decline in support for higher ed. And in fact, we now know that there's a, there's a political skew there, right? Now, Repub people who uh, uh, affiliate with the Republican Party are now the majority of people who are saying that higher education is not essential to getting ahead in life. Right? Less in terms of Democrats, but even on the Democratic side, we've seen an erosion of support for higher education. 
And so it's, it's trending in that way, and these presidents and chancellors are also very aware of that. All right, so I'd like to go on. But I'm frozen. Oh, there we go. All right, so um, those were just 27 presidents and chancellors, right? I mean, it, uh, the majority of the presidents and chancellors who are at land grant institutions, but certainly it's their viewpoint from the 20,000 foot level, right? So what we did then, we decided that we didn't want to have a book about just their opinions. So we went out and we did a snowball sampling strategy where we started asking people who studied these things, who should we be, t we be talking to to validate some of, of what we're hearing? And so we ended up collecting interviews from 35 other individuals, and you can see they were both inside of academia and outside of it, to say, what is it that you think about these seven different themes and the dynamic tensions? And what we found was, out there, folks, there is no dynamic tension. That in everyone else's mind, those dynamic tensions are very clearly resolved in one direction. So we heard very clearly that universities should be focused on being more efficient. Second, that they really should be paying attention to their teaching and engagement excellence. And if and only if, they're going to have any resources left over for research. They should be doing research that's more applied in orientation. Next, we were told these national rankings are meaningless, something I personally knew. But they also said that, there, that anything that's done to increase national rankings comes at such a cost to accessibility and affordability that no one should be out there doing that. And so, hence, the emphasis really was on becoming more accessible and affordable to all students. These um, thought leaders rejected the whole notion of rural versus urban. They really felt that if universities were to adopt more of a community orientation, that most of the distinctions between what rural communities need and urban communities, most but not all, would be eliminated by a focus on community. And uh, the next piece was even more clear from folks. This internationalization, this push towards globalization comes at a great cost. And if we are not able to clearly translate what the closer to home impact is, we should not be involved in it. And then that really is, has became, again, my idea for what a formula for success would look like in terms of creating this greater return on investment for public higher education. OK, so the question that I raised uh, previously, are we committing unforced errors right now? Yes, we clearly are. And so I think uh, one of the things, and again, I'm preaching to the choir here, we definitely need to be focusing more on our teaching excellence and pouring more resources into our teaching excellence. And when we are involved in teaching excellence, we should be making that count. I heard a wonderful story from John earlier about how your uh, involvement in this counts in the P&T process, and that you can earn badges on your way that gets put into your uh, dossier, and that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. But it's not just pouring resources into teaching excellence alone that we have to be paying attention to. There's another problem inside of our teaching efforts, and I want to talk about that. In order to do that, let's briefly do a historical perspective on our own mission. Way back in 1862, that's Justin Morrill right there, and in the Land Grant Act, we were literally, all of all the universities were granted land for a singular purpose. And that was to create America's first public institutions of higher learning. We didn't have them before 1862. They were all private. And the focus was very specifically on access and affordability. How do we know that? Here's a direct quote from the Morrill Act. Notice that what is underlined there is, education of the industrial classes. Now, we don't use that term anymore. We use the term working classes to describe 
Thank you, John. The people who we are really supposed to be involved in teaching efforts with. Also, remember that the Moral II Act in 1890, which was first and foremost an act that was designed to give more support to the 1862 institutions, also brought in the historically black colleges and universities and provided more funding for, again, this idea of funding those most in need of help when it came to support for, for public higher education. And then again, although this was not a moral act, in 1994 with one of the farm bills, we then saw what I would like to say is the third of the land grant act, which began to provide funds to do the same thing for Native American colleges and universities. So together, these three land grant acts created our core mission of teaching. But teaching for America's working class communities, right? The idea that we are providing access and affordable education for the working classes. We are not doing that right now. Across the country, this is another unforced error. And so I say this in terms of we, are, we have actually forgotten who it is that we are supposed to be serving. So let me give you an example. I don't know what the statistics are here in, in Utah, but let me give you the Ohio statistics. Four out of every five incoming freshmen on the Columbus campus at The Ohio State University come from families that are at or above the mean income for America's families. At or about four out of five. That's not the working class, right? That's not the industrial class. I don't know what happens here in Logan, but let me say that what is good about what happens at Ohio State is we also have four regional campuses. Now, on the regional campuses, 50% of all of our incoming freshmen are actually Pell Grant eligible. That's a better approximation of who the industrial classes are, right? But, so what that means is, Ohio State has optioned out its land-grant focus to its regional campuses. And this was not, by the way, done by design. This was done as an afterthought to the whole process of moving towards becoming a top 10 university in the eyes of US News and World Report. So, this is another unforced error that we have to deal with. But I also want to go beyond just teaching, and I want to look at the second part of our mission. And again, to go back historically, we know that in 1887, Representative Hatch from the US Congress put forward something that ended up bearing his name, the Hatch Act, which was that federal monies were going to begin to be given to our state universities in order to conduct the research that these communities most needed to solve the societal problems of the day. So originally, it was all about agriculturally related research, but it over time grew to encompass lots of different areas that uh, had something to do with the land grant mission of meeting the needs of the communities. But there's another unforced error here. Research has become the coin of the realm. Research now seems to be what most land grant universities put forward first in terms of what they try to present themselves as. Give you a quick example. So one of those 27 presidents that I talked to told me when I got on the phone with him, this was going to be a really short conversation. I apologized. I said I was sorry. I was trying to set up with the executive assistant 15 minutes where the, you know, the president would have enough time to talk to me. And he inter interrupted. He goes, no, 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 no. I have a whole hour. So I was really puzzled. And I said, so I'm sorry. Why is this going to be a short conversation? And he said, because we don't consider ourselves a land grant university. Now, when I did these interviews, I had mon monitors up and I had their home pages and bio sketches. And I'm looking at that particular university's web presence. And it said right on the top, land grant university. And so I'm really puzzled. And I'm on the phone. And I said, oh, 
well, what do you consider yourself? And he said, we consider ourselves a premier research university. Now, this was an IRB protocol, and so I kept my mouth shut, but the thing that was screaming in my head was, you can be both. And yet, imagine if that's the view from the presidency, which means it's also the view of the governing board, then it can't but help to have an enormous trickle-down effect on how the university itself operates. Now, what's worse, however, in terms of unforced errors is when we create narratives as land grants, we do that in such a way where we start talking about research expenditures and dollars that we've, get, we've gained, right? And by the way, what do you think the public hears when they hear that we've gotten $100 billion in research? They think we don't need any more money. Even though, and this is the crazy-making aspect of this, most universities lose 25% on every dollar that they bring in from a research perspective. We're losing money when we do research. And yet what we're doing is we're out bragging about all of these dollars, and the public completely misunderstands that. Now, I have a lot of things that I could say about that, but what would you think would happen if we tried to change the narrative such that instead of talking about research expenditures, we began to talk about how that actually connects back to our teaching mission. And even more importantly, internally, what if we started rewarding researchers, not for the amount of dollars that they got, but rather the number of scientists that they trained? Imagine how the narrative changes. Imagine how the value system changes if we are able to create a different scenario of what research is supposed to mean at a land-grant university. Now, I could go on, but I'm very short on time, so I just want to go back to our third part of our mission, the Smith-Lever Act, which was uh, brought in in 1914, which created cooperative extension services. This was great because now this gave us the mission of serving the community, right? We were supposed to do this research and do this great teaching and then push it out into the community and help people through various other means outside of the classroom to benefit from the knowledge that we were generating. Now, is this an unforced error? Not exactly. That's your logo, by the way. You know a lot about community-engaged learning, right? We do this a lot, except our big problem is we struggle in terms of how we quantify the impact that we have both on the community but also on the students who are engaged in these efforts. And worse, there's unfortunately this continued disconnect between our cooperative extension services people. How many people have an extension appointment in here? A good number and the rest of the university. At Ohio State, Extension exists inside of our College of Agriculture. Uh, 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 it's got a longer name than that, but it's, it's ag. And everyone outside of ag oftentimes just says, well, Extension, that's about agriculture, right? We've ghettoized Extension at the Ohio State University. And I, unfortunately, uh, I think in all but 12 universities, and I don't know what happens here in, in at Utah State, but uh, I should have checked on this um, because then I could probably avoid saying something politically incorrect. But um, I'll say that there are 12 universities across the country, 12 land grants, in which cooperative extension services does not exist inside of the College of Agriculture, but is rather part of the larger university structure. And it seems that in those universities, something very different is happening with regards to the relationship between extension and the rest of the campus. Okay, so uh, if you haven't gotten this already, I think that there's a profound imbalance, that little feather there, that's research, and it seems to be really driving a lot of what is happening at land-grant universities. But again, a lot of what is happening there is because we've made choices to make that imbalance happen. So my question and the central challenge to our land grants is, are we astute enough to listen to what our audience is saying to us about what we should be doing. Remember the formula for success, right? Now, this is based on 27 uh, presidents and 35 additional thought leaders. 
So what we're now doing, and this is my next research project, is we're going to validate that formula for success by actually going out. And now we're going to start surveying citizens <coughs> excuse me, about these themes. And so we've picked the four most populous states, California, New York, Texas, and Florida. And then we've also picked Ohio and West Virginia because President Gee and I are, writing, uh, are doing this research project and we'll be writing a book off of it as well. We are going to start with the citizens and then we are going to, across the political spectrum, figure out what people from different, uh, thank you, John, people from different political stripes think, and then we are going to go to the lawmakers in these states and ask them for their opinions on what it is that we hear from their own constituents. Eventually, we hope to get larger funding that would allow us to do more of a national sample in this way. But my own perception, is this is what I think we're going to hear from citizens. Stop complaining about your own funding levels or create disaster for yourself. Brag about your grant money, right? Ignore the utility of your research. Worry about your US news and world ranking. Put rural and urban issues together in a framework where it seems like it's a zero sum game and then focus intensively on your in international focus. That's the disaster recipe for higher education. Fortunately, however, and the good news that you all actually know is that we do lots and lots of great things, right? We have teaching excellence, or you all wouldn't be here. We do great research that actually creates discoveries and inventions and innovations that are just absolutely wonderful. And we do consistently engage with the community in wonderful ways. We just have to get better at creating a narrative for our external stakeholders, and we need to get better at internally rewarding things across the board in a more even manner. So since I used the tennis metaphor, I, th I, st I thought I would end with a quote from Arthur Ashe, which I think is uh, absolutely a land-grant statement. It is not the urge to surpass all others at whatever cost, but the urge to serve others at whatever cost. So who's feeling a little bit more land-grant fierce right now? Or perhaps a little less land-grant frazzled. Thank you for listening to me. I've tried to keep 10 minutes for questions and answers, and so this is the time to do that. We have, we have microphones, and I can't see really well, so we have a question though already. Great. Um, you mentioned something about 25% of research dollars being lost. Could you say a little more about that? I don't understand what you mean. Sure. So you know that we get both direct dollars and indirect dollars for our research. The vast majority of public land-grant universities do not recoup the full amount of costs for the indirect. And so there are various different estimations that um, uh, uh, have been given by different research officers across the nation, but the figure that, that seems to be the average is that we lose about 25 cents on the dollar with the indirects, that we're not getting enough basically for our indirect costs. That's what I meant by that. Other questions? Okay, all right, we're just waiting for a microphone. I'm just curious, are you presenting this to the college deans and the department heads, this Am information here? <laughs> well, I will have the opportunity to be meeting with your provost and some of the senior leaders a little bit later today. So um, I also, though, this is actually, I should have mentioned this earlier, this talk, which is the first time I've given a talk narrowed to, to this level about teaching excellence is part of a position paper that I'm also uh, generating. So if I don't hit them here, my hope is that they, they can read this kind of thing at some point. So, but I, I take it from your question that you obviously think that this has to permeate up, not just down. Yes, and I agree with you. And we have another question in the back there? Well, um, first of all, thank you very much for your talk. Very, very important. 
Um, you mentioned in one of your formulas when you had the slide, you mentioned that there was a unbalance between interna internationalization versus closer to home impact. But this came when you, pres when you interviewed your 35 people. So I would like to know who were your people? It, because it makes a difference if the persons you interview regarding the international initiatives versus uh, people who are not familiar with internationalization and if the person is bilingual or trilingual or multilingual. So do you have any idea of that? Because that, I think that that would be different mm -hmm. in our context. That's the only yeah. reason. Thank you. No, thank you. That's a great question. And again, that's why currently I feel that the next important part of this formula for success is actually taking this out to the citizens themselves and asking them, you're the taxpayers, what is it that you think we should be doing with your money? So first, I think that's important. Second, to be fair to all of the thought leaders that I talked to, or at least the vast majority of them, they were knowledgeable and in fact very much did value the effort at internationalization. However, they felt that if we could not translate the international efforts, the efforts at globalization, to an understanding of how it does benefit our state citizens, that's where we get into trouble. Not that we shouldn't be doing it, but if we can't explain how it actually helps us, then that's where the trouble comes in. Other questions? Yes, right here in the front. Yeah, you mentioned applied research as sort of one of the things that would really be a part of the formula for success. Can you talk about one or two applied research projects that you've seen that sort of model um, model this and would really meet the land-grant fierce mission? Sure. Um, well, let me give you one of the best examples, and I don't know how many people in here are aware of the Engaged Scholarship Consortium. Do people know that? Anybody? Anybody? ESC? It's going to be in Denver this year. Okay. So, for those of you who would be interested in engaged scholarship and, and applied research, I would highly recommend looking at a conference like this and an organization. Um, so uh, High Fitzgerald, Hiram Fitzgerald, is the, one of the past presidents. Uh, he's at Michigan State. And uh, I think that his research is probably one of the greatest examples. He is a psychologist. He's a social psychologist by training. And he has gone all, out into the indigenous communities in Michigan. And he has looked to create research where it's informed by the perspectives of the indigenous tribes that he's dealing with. So the example that he always likes to give is that you can do engaged scholarship in a way in which it is actually very scholarly, scholarly um, astute, and yet it has clear meaning in terms of immediate benefits for the population that you're actually looking at. So I think that's the kind of thing that I think of uh, I think of the, the work that he's doing in particular. But let me also, since you didn't ask this question, but let me just say, uh, it's not that basic research is devalued in the, this context. It's simply that there needs to be a better resources put towards and, and better valuing of applied research. Part of the problem here is that basic research, think particle accelerators, cost an enormous amount of money. Right? So the grants that are given for this kind of research are huge. And, but by the way, that means that we're, we're losing huger amounts of money on this, too, by, just as a by the way. right? But that tends to be much more impressive. And again, um, we talked about administrators earlier. I'm a former administrator, so I can say this with a straight face. Oftentimes, administrators can't read, but they can count. So we count dollars, right? And we say, oh, that must be more important. And that's really what I'm driving at here in terms of that imbalance, is that we need to value, in this case, just use High Fitzgerald's work, we need to value of the, the work that's being done with indigenous tribes at the same level of particle accelerators. That's really what I'm after here. Well, I have one minute and one more question. 
So the uh, moral act, as you showed, uh, emphasized uh, teaching both liberal and practical education. Is there any danger here in emphasizing the practical and forgetting the original charge for liberal education as well? Sure. With great question. Thanks. And a good one to end on. Um, from the standpoint of we have felt, especially as land grants, that one of our outs has been when, and in fact, uh, let me just use a very specific example. Becky Blank, who is the chancellor at the University of Wisconsin, came to the Ohio State campus to give a, an, a talk at our annual land grant lecture. And she talked about one of the ways, and, and um, Wisconsin's been famous, right, for their former governor kind of bashing higher ed and cutting funding and right, all those kinds of things. Well, her trick in terms of getting around all of that political stuff was to say, we're the practical people. We're the people who are solving problems and creating jobs. So the danger is that we're going to continue to pursue that path as opposed to saying, but wait, the arts and the humanities and all of these other pursuits that are part of a comprehensive university have to be a part of that as well. And, and by the way, it, that's not something that just happened in the 20, 21st century, right? Moral himself gave a speech 20 years after the initial act saying, I didn't say just practical. I actually said liberal and practical. So even he back then, uh, it would have been 1880 something, was giving a speech on exactly this kind of uh, conflict that oftentimes people would see. So I think it is good. I think we should be the people who are saying that we're pragmatic and we're practical and we're solving the world's problems, but not to the detriment of the arts, the humanities, and, and all of the other things. All right, so my time is up. I have to end on that. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate it.